Welcome to our online service. We are so glad to have you with us. My name is Nathan and I'm the lead pastor here at Orange Baptist Church. We would love to keep blessing you and one of the key ways you can partner with us is by sharing and liking and subscribing to this channel uh, and sharing this content through a whole multitude of platforms uh, so that we might see other people blessed in the good news of Jesus. Another key way of partnering with us is that if you are blessed by this, that you might consider partnering with us financially here uh, at the work of Orange Baptist Church. And then one of the key ways to do that is through our online giving platform, and the details for that are below in the description. We want to be praying for you, and we want you to connect with us. So if you need prayer at any point along the way, please shoot us an email at prayer at orangebaptistchurch.org.au, and a team of people are waiting to pray with you and for you. And if you are ever in the local vicinity of Orange in New South Wales, please drop in, come and see us on a Sunday morning. We would love to worship with you and to celebrate Jesus together. Be blessed. Jesus, we thank you that as we trust our whole lives to you, that we can be sure that no part of this age there will be that we're without you. Recently, several of our sisters and our brother were baptised here amongst us. Lord, we ask you to strengthen them to live in the reality of your presence in their lives and together with all of us. Strengthen them in the challenging times as well as the enjoyable times. And Lord, we ask that you will comfort those who have lost loved ones and been affected by these um, damaging earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. Please give hope to those who are survivors to be able to rebuild their lives after so much losses. And we know that uh, the devastation of loss from lives is not a new thing to you, something that you fully understand and have experienced yourself. We ask that you will also give your peace to those among us who mourn the loss of their loved ones. For Tim Gardner and his family in the loss of his dad. For Andrew and Danny Riles in the loss of Andrew's grandmother and Michelle Boschancic and family. Thank you for the life that you have given them. And as this year, this calendar year in 2023 is now in full swing, we thank you for all the opportunities you give us as we turn our attention and our wills towards you to try to know your heart for us. Guide us by your hand into your ways and your paths. Grant us understanding of your plans for us. A renewed vision of your glory and your call for us to disciple, baptise and to teach. Whenever we are anxious or in fear about what is ahead, remind us of your perfect presence with us. And so we say thank you, our Lord. Amen. Today's reading comes from the first book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 1 through to 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel, to Israel? He said to them, 
It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After this, he said, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood alongside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus has been taken from you into heaven. He will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. We're going to jump into the book of Acts. We're going to spend, well, the whole term actually in the book of Acts. Uh, We're going to spend a lot of time and then we're going to have Easter and then we're going to continue in the book of Acts. And here's why. This year, uh, in January of this year, marked eight years since my family and I turned up here, which is kind of crazy to think about because I remarkably look the same age as I did (laughs) back then. It's quite phenomenal. Actually, it was really funny. Josiah sent me a GIF, uh, and in this GIF it said, said, um, uh, you know you're in trouble when you think you're 26, you behave like a 14-year-old, but your body says that you're near death. And underneath it was, that's you, Dad. Um, So he's not living with us anymore. Um, So, yeah, he also needs a house to stay, anyone? Um, You too can be mocked. Uh, So it is this kind of thing. It's this crazy thing that we've been here for this period of time. Uh, And as we were kind of planning at the back end of last year to come into this year, we knew that this was going to be a year where we would rediscover, hence the theme of this year, rediscover. Now, what this is not about, this is not rediscovering God as if somehow we had lost him. Rather, this is a process that after being here for some period of time, where in 2016 we we sought the Lord collectively in a very much smaller community of faith at that time about what God might do with us, now is a chance as a larger community of faith with a couple of different services to come together and rediscover what Jesus has for His church. The very purpose on what our church is to be and the purpose of all churches, but more than that is to specifically seek out his vision on what it's going to look like specifically for us to make an impact for the glory of God in our community and beyond. And there's no better way then rediscovering what God's will is for His church and what He would like to do with us than to go back to the very foundation of the early church, which is the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a really special book to me because I honestly believe it is the very heart of what we are to become. It gives us a, a picture. It's, it's, um, it's descriptive, if you will, of what the church looked like, but it's more than just being descriptive. It is also prescriptive of what the church is to look like and its focus and its points of difference. And that's what I want us to rediscover. When I got here, I remember sitting in the interview room and being asked what I think the church is going to look like. And I was like, I think the church is found in the book of Acts. And it's true, I still hold that deep conviction. So as we journey through this book of Acts, I want you to do some work. I want you to look at what does the church look like? Not by which, what does it look like in a building? Oh, what does it look like practically in the early church? The good, the bad and the ugly, of which there is plenty of all three. But what does it look like? What does it look like to have Jesus as the head? What does it look like for us to be empowered, really empowered by the Spirit? What is this going to look like? Because in a month's time, just over a month's time, we're going to be gathering together to pray and discern and to start looking specifically at what we are going to to be praying into to ask the Lord to do among us into our own community. So with all of that in the background, let's jump into the book of Acts. Let's go searching. Let's have a conversation. See what God does. Let me pray. 
Lord, as we jump into your word this morning, with my whole heart, I ask you that you would do an incredible work in our hearts and in our minds and in our will, that we as a community of faith might learn more of you and that we might be shaped more to your will. That we would be submissive to your callings, Holy Spirit. That we would be open and obedient to whatever direction you might take us for your glory. That we might lay down all of our tradition and our ideas and submit ourselves to you. Lord, as we start here in Acts 1, may we be blown away by you again. May you set a firm foundation that redirects us. And may it be for the praise of your name, for the encouragement of each of us, And that as a means, people might come to know you and your liberation and your goodness. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we dive in. Acts 1, 1 to 2. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. It begins with an introduction. An introduction from who? Luke. Good old Luke. Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke. And here what we have is in my former book, that is the Gospel of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. So he's written this first book. This is now the sequel, if you will. This is his second book that moves from just the works that Jesus had done in the Gospels now to the works that Jesus continues to do into the local church and into the early church, right? And you ask this question, okay, so that's kind of like, that's the content, but what was the purpose on Luke writing the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts? Well, we have to go back into the very beginnings of the Gospel of Luke to discover that. This is what he says. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses to the servants of the Word. So straight off the bat, Luke makes it abundantly clear that he is collecting and compiling the stories that had taken place from the eyewitnesses who were not just randoms, but who were servants of the Word. That being the Logos, and that being Jesus Himself. We go back to what Caleb had spoken on earlier on in January. Back in John chapter 1, we know that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God, the Logos. He's making it abundantly clear that this compilation is material of those who are servants of Jesus who walked alongside Him. This is an accurate account of the things that actually took place. Theophilus, with a cool name, is actually a real person. I also love the fact that Theophilus actually means friend of God. I think that's quite beautiful that, that, that Luke would be writing an account of all that Jesus did to a friend of God. I, I like that, but that's just a side point. That's just me. Moving on. But at this point, Theophilus is a real guy. These are a compilation of the stories of those who walked with, alongside and saw all that Jesus did. And the purpose of which is this. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know with certainty of the things that you have been taught. Two reasons. One, he wants to write an orderly account that's easy for us to understand and to see, but so that we might have certainty that the things that have been told about Jesus are real and evident 
that we can have certainty as we read through the, the Gospel of Luke and as we read through the book of Acts, that we know that this is really what happened. And that's super important as we kick off because there's some crazy stories in the book of Acts. Crazy stories. And they are true. That God is at work in miraculous ways in the life of believers for the proclamation of His gospel, for the expansion of His kingdom. And it happened then and it happens now. Yeah? Happened then, happens now. I am no cessationist. I believe that God wants to do His miraculous works for the glory of His name through the power of His Spirit. And that's what we see. So that when these things take place, that we as believers, as it was for the first century, would have certainty that our faith is true, that Jesus is who He says He is, that there should be no need for doubt, that the way He wants to build His church is indeed His will. Are you with me? This is a firm foundation as we rediscover that this is legit, that this is legit and that we need to dive in. So with that, he begins like this. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do. Often when we come to the book of Acts, we talk about Acts as in the Acts of the Apostles, right? That's how it's been presented time and time again. That's wrong. It's not. It's acts, it is the Acts of the risen Jesus, through the power of His Spirit, in and through the life of His believers. This is super important right now because at this point we have all of the works that Jesus began to do and here is what He continues to do. Which is why at the very end of chapter 2, where you get to the end of chapter 2 and we see all of these people come to the Lord and they broke bread in their homes and they were praising God and enjoying all the favour of the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It wasn't the apostles who were adding to their number daily those who were being saved. Who was adding to their number? It's the Lord. The Lord Jesus, through the power of His Spirit, building His church, building his kingdom as he had done as he walked on earth. Are you with me? So this is a continuation of the ministry of Jesus, the book of Acts. Through the power of his spirit in the lives of his believers. And then he says this. Until the day that he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After his sufferings, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. There is no mistake. There's no mistake that Jesus was resurrected. That he was starting something new in building his church. And he didn't do it just as a figment of people's imaginations. It didn't be spawn out of the incredible grief that his apostles had at his death. No, no, no. It was the risen Jesus who was working and showing himself in front of these disciples in absolute certainty. Yeah? To the point where he actually was eating with them. He was producing proofs and the likes, but he was eating with them and ghosts don't eat. That's my experience. Ghosts don't eat. I've seen Casper. It just goes straight through. That's what I've seen. Movies are real. Okay. On one occasion, while he was still eating with them, <laughs> no ghost, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you'll be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Now this is where things start to get real for the believers. So as we look back at what happened at the end of, of the Gospel of Luke, what are we left with? We're left with the resurrection of Jesus. But there's a lot of turmoil around at the end of that. There's a whole bunch of chief priests and Sadducees and local rulers who were none too impressed that Jesus had... Well, risen again. 
and they were searching for his disciples. Things were a little dicey, not particularly comfortable. And now the risen Jesus says to his disciples, here, right, this is what we're going to be the case. Do not leave Jerusalem. That's the very hotbed of the nastiness. So the disciples are told, stay in the midst of pain. Stay when you know that everyone is hounding you. And at that point, I'd be like, um, can I leave? Like, you can, com- you can commission me any way you like, but just outside of Jerusalem, because I'm not particularly impressed with all of the pressure that is coming down upon us. But Jesus says, no, I want you to stay in Jerusalem and I want you to wait for the gift that my Father has promised. And what is this gift that He promises? The Holy Spirit. The very Spirit of God who would dwell within the people and who would take the place where it is of the most turmoil and out of this place and out of deep pain and the potential of suffering and the potential of destruction, this Spirit of God will burst this new church as God does a new thing. And from this place, it will spread to the ends of the earth. And so the disciples are told to stay. Stay and wait for the one who has been promised to them time and time again. The Holy Spirit has been with God from the beginning because He is God. Even at the beginning of creation, we know that the Spirit was hovering over the waters. Throughout all of the Old Testament, we see the work of the Spirit, but His manifest presence is kind of withheld a little bit. Even through the ministry of Jesus, we see Jesus at the forefront and we know that the Spirit is at work, but again, it is, He is held back at that point. Now there is a promise that the Spirit would come in His manifest presence for all to see. It had been promised by Jesus. We trail back through the Gospels. We go into Gospel Gospel of John, into chapter 14, 15 to 16. It says this, If you love me, you'll keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. John 14, later on in the chapter, in verse 25 and 26, it says, All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all these things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. And here, I think the church today needs to listen to this. And Luke 24, 49, Jesus says, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And the Holy Spirit comes. It isn't going to be, oh, oh, really, you're here. There is going to be power in the life of believers and in His church for a particular purpose, which we're about to discover. The Holy Spirit has been promised to them that they would know His manifest presence, His manifest power, one who would reveal more of Jesus to them, one who would purify them, one who would unite them, one who would empower them for the ministry in which Jesus has for them. He is the one who they are to wait for. They had to wait days. That would have driven me insane. Not real good at the waiting bit. And yet the promise is here. And he says to these disciples, wait in Jerusalem because I'm about to do something new. I'm about to do something new. Now you would think at this point that the disciples kind of would have had some kind of an idea on what Jesus was about to do. You know, since he'd been talking about the coming of the kingdom of God and that there would be liberation You know how he'd been kind of displaying that through a multitude of healings, sight to the blind, raising of the dead, you know, casting out of demons. One who'd come and talked about that that the kingdom would break out into this world. One in which hope would rise. You'd think that they'd kind of understand at least some of this, but they don't. They don't. 
Because after Jesus had just said, just wait here, I'm going to baptise you with the Holy Spirit, they answer with this. They gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Now I'm going to break this down for you because you're looking like, I don't get that. So here we go. Throughout the Old Testament, time and time again, the people of God have been looking for the Messiah. The Messiah who would come and restore Israel to its glory as the people of God. A Messiah who would come and would break the shackles of human oppressors like Rome, that they would be at the centre of the world, that the temple would be restored, that God would reside in his temple and that Israel themselves would be blessed. In other words, they were entirely focused on earthly things that would impact them. They were so focused on what was directly in front of them that they could not get what Jesus was saying and had been saying for three years with them. And now, even in his resurrected form, they're still misunderstanding. And they're like, so you're going to make things cushy for us, right? Like you're going to overthrow the Romans. You're going to, we're going to have a military kind of setup where we're all in control. Yeah, Jesus, that's how this is going to play out because like that's what, I'm sure what the Old Testament said. So um, you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel. To which Jesus doesn't rebuke them directly, but gives them this answer. He said to them, oh, it's not for you to know the times and the dates of the Father that are set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. To which point they're like, I get the Jerusalem bit. Um, Cool with that. But um, this whole Judea, yeah, all right, maybe. Samaria? We really need to look at your diet, Jesus, because things aren't going well. And to the ends of the earth? No, 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 the kingdom of Israel, it's just about Jerusalem and Judea. It's like the protected bunch. We're going to be the holy ones and we're going to be setting ourselves apart. That's how this works, Jesus. I'm not sure you got the memo. Jesus goes, no, 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 no. No. This is going to be far bigger, far greater than anything you can imagine. This isn't about uh, one ethnic kind of group. This kingdom isn't about one people. In fact, the kingdom that I'm about to break in is not even a physical kingdom. Primarily, it's a spiritual kingdom where it will not be about the markings on the external, but the change of heart from the internal that would change every part of the people where their minds would be renewed and their hearts would be restored and their eyes would be seen. It's like what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that in Christ we are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, where everyone would be birthed new, new eyes, new heart, new purpose, new direction, new hope. I'm doing something new, Jesus says. This isn't about one little pocket group. This is far bigger and it's going to incorporate everyone. This isn't one geographical location. This spiritual kingdom is going to reach to the farthest ends of the earth, even into Samaria, which as we heard from Pete a couple of weeks ago, was like the the kind of weird second cousins with the sixth finger. They were the dirty people that you don't engage with. They were the mudbloods that had kind of been kind of connected with the kind of the pagans and and they're they're disgusting. We don't deal with them. He just goes, no, we're we're going to them. No, they're welcome into the kingdom. And even more than that, even these weirdos in Australia, they're welcome too. (laughs) That was so good. Yay. I hope you recorded that. (laughs) This kingdom is going to reach to the ends of the earth. It's going to be an international spiritual kingdom that is going to break in constantly until the the culmination of the kingdom when Jesus returns. And we're recipients of this, 
right? We're recipients of this. So you look at the life of our community of faith. We've got people from South Africa. We've got people from Canada, people from Europe. We've got people from the Solomon Islands. We've got people from all parts of Africa. We've even got people from New Zealand. <laughs> Nothing says the power of God than the salvation of Kiwis. <laughs> Hi, Kiwi friends. It's good of you to join us online. Um, just want to bless you. Kazi bro and chur. This is, this is the reality. Like this is this kingdom that breaks into the ends of the earth. This is what we're a part of. And you know how it reaches out to the ends of the earth? Through the empowering of the Spirit given to us, made manifest in the life of the disciples who take this message of hope and see people restored. Jesus is building a new kingdom that looks entirely different from anything that anyone could ever imagine. This spiritual kingdom, an international kingdom, a kingdom that is now and not yet. You're like, okay, I get the first two. I don't understand the the now and the not yet business. Well, the kingdom is present wherever the king of that kingdom is present. Yeah? Yeah? So when Jesus turns up, when He says, repent because the kingdom of God has come near, what He's saying is, the king is here and anyone who comes to me is now a part of this kingdom. And this kingdom as we live it out now is supposed to be a foretaste of the total kingdom that is yet to come, the kind of kingdom that we see in the coming of the Lord in His second coming in the book of Revelation. Which which means this, this is what's crazy. So who here is a follower of Jesus? Who here has had their hearts transformed? So you know wherever you go, the Kingdom of God is present. Not because you're there, but because of the One who dwells in us. And as we go, we are to be the advocates of the Kingdom of God that we live out this kingdom and that we speak of this kingdom, inviting other people to become citizens too because we introduce them to the king. Are you with me? And you go, well, I can't do that. I can't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm so afraid. I'm not particularly good at kind of sharing this stuff. I'm not, you know, it's hard for me. I know because you're human. I'm too weak. I know. Me too. Which is great, right? That we're going to receive power, verse 8, when the Holy Spirit comes on you. In other words, you're not going to do it anyway because it is the works of the risen Jesus. It's the acts of the risen Jesus through the manifest presence of the Spirit in the lives of His believers, through the lives of His believers. So if you're too weak, join the club or join the kingdom. It's not us. We're just to be willing participants that would be humble enough to open our arms and go, Lord, you are really, really good. I cannot believe that you have bought my salvation. What else do I do but humbly lay myself before you and then open my hands and say, whatever you would have me do, Lord, you do. In, in your power and in your name alone. It's what the disciples are called to do. They're commissioned when they receive the power of the Spirit to go out into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And you know what that looks like? Read the book of Acts that tells you the story. That's why we're going to study it. Because it begins in Jerusalem and wouldn't you know it, goes out into Judea. And guess what? Do you know where it goes next? Samaria. And uh, yeah, right, so there's a fan tail on this one. Where does it end up? Australia. To the ends of the earth, Australia. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> yeah, all right. Thanks, Sammy. Someone's alive with me. This is where it goes. This is, this is how the book of Acts, it begins. It lays a foundation of what the church is to be. And then, and then it goes... And then he did it. 
and then he did it. What do you think they do with this message, the disciples? Well, they stare up into the sky because this is how it plays out. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Now, I just want to stop there for a minute. I just just want you to sit with this for a little bit, right? Because like we read it uh, and we go, cool, okay, they hit him and then he went up into the sky and cool, cool, cool. Um, Read it for the first time. It's a little out there, right? Like it's a little out there. Jesus had just been with the disciples. He just told them what to do, stay in Jerusalem. He just told them that the Spirit's gonna come. And at that point, they're like, cool. Well, we've walked with Jesus for the last three years. We've sat with Him. We've watched Him die. How cool is it when He came back to life? That worked out nicely for us. Everything we've done is in the presence of Jesus. He's been with us at every point along the way. Surely He's gonna hang around with us in Jerusalem. And then He doesn't. He performs the ultimate disappearing act and literally rises into the sky. Again, just certainty so that we know that these things actually happened. Call me a fool. I I, I take it at face value. I I think this is how it happened. And this is how I know that it happened because it doesn't glorify the disciples' response because they're like this. For it must have been a really long time Because at this point, you get this, and they were looking intently, (laughs) intently. I reckon they looked stupidly, right? That's just me. Up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white robes stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. In other words, Jesus has just told them, get ready, I'm about to commission you. Instead of getting ready, they stood there with their hands in their pockets going, oh, what on earth? And so two angels appear and go, what are you doing? They can't even speak. He goes, why are you looking up into heaven? He's going to come back again. In other words, a little less chit-chat, a little more tap-tap. Off you go. Go and get ready. I told you what's going to happen. He's told you what's happening. Don't stand here with your pockets all consumed in your own presence. Move, go, go go and get yourselves ready because the Holy Spirit's about to come. Sort yourselves out. It's a gentle rebuke because they're all too busy going, what do we do next? Well, I told you. I've already, he's already told us what's next. Go. They're still so consumed in what they're doing that they're waiting for the next thing, even though they've been told. Those silly disciples. We would never do that. Because we're all too busy doing the work of the kingdom, right? Like none of us are standing there kind of focused so intently on our own circumstances, even the good bits and the right bits. We're not not consumed in what we're doing at all. We're not trying to build our own kingdom. We're not kind of standing there kind of with our hands in our pockets looking to the sky waiting for God to, you know, get to the ends of the earth and come back and just sweep us up into some cosmic vacuum so we can kind of have the good life. We, We don't do that, do we? We can't possibly be doing that because we're, we're too busy being empowered by the Spirit doing the ministry in which God has given us. Isn't, isn't that right, everyone? Do you know the truth? I spend way too much time with my hands in my pockets looking at the sky. I don't know about you, but... Uh, kind of so easy just to focus on what's going on that I forget my very purpose our very purpose, that as disciples, that we're called to build the kingdom of God in His power, for His glory. And we we get consumed in doing the things that are good, right? Raising children, going to work. These are good things. Like I encourage you to raise your children. I really do. I encourage you to feed them. I encourage you to go to work. I encourage you to, you know, pay your bills. I really do but that's supposed to be done in the midst of a greater purpose, which is 
to glorify Jesus, being empowered by His Spirit to the ends of the earth. That's our purpose. And we need to keep rediscovering this. I need to keep rediscovering this. Because if we don't, then Jesus will return. And do you know what he'll find? Been waiting for this. Gee, you took a while. Good to see you. It's not how it's meant to be. It's not. Do you remember when I said that, that the book of Acts, it's descriptive, but it's also prescriptive. In other words, it details for us all the things that have happened so that we know with certainty that as we live our lives, it's not for nothing. This isn't just an intellectual exercise. This following Jesus means that from the tips of our head to the, to the ends of our toes are supposed to be for the glory of God. That, that, that our days are made up for building His kingdom so that He would be glorified and that the very purpose of that is meaningful, the greatest meaning of all, that, that when the heaven and earth are rejoined, that we would see that we have poured out our lives for the glory of God for real reasons and for great joy and for great purpose. And it was not a waste of a life. Do you know what's a waste of a life? That's a waste. And I've wasted too much already. How about you? I know we we don't know what this looks like and I know that we're a little afraid and, you know, you're probably like, this guy's just mean. Well, I try to be nice too sometimes. But, but, but this is what we're called to. We, we've got to take this stuff seriously. If we're going to be the church, truly be the church of God, then we need to take this seriously, yeah? Like, can I get at least one amen on that one? Just, just anyone. I know it's costly, but it's worth it because our Lord is going to come again. We need to be empowered by the Spirit. Do you know what that means? That we need to be open to the Spirit who wants to use us. We're going to get into chapter 2 next week and we're going to see the manifest presence of God in the most unbelievable of ways. There's going to be wind and fire and tongues. It's going to be crazy. And you know what else happens? People come to faith, people hear the gospel, people respond. And I believe that the book of Acts is both descriptive and prescriptive. And so my expectation is that the manifest presence of God would be revealed to us as well and that He would save people and that His gifts of the Spirit would actually be real in the life of the church. So again, for the second time, I am not a cessationist. But I don't believe that the church can actually be the church without the full Word of God and the full of the Spirit all the time. And that's what I want us to see. We need to be open to the works of the Holy Spirit who wants to use us for the expansion of His kingdom and the glory of Jesus. And so we need to be ready. So with that, I'm going to pray that we would be ready. Lord God, you, Lord God, I confess that we treat you so small. That we try to box you. And that we try to hide from you. And we try to do your work when it suits us. Or at least I do. And so I confess that to you and I ask you, Lord, that not only would you forgive me, but that you would empower me by your spirit that we might truly live for you and for your glory. That until you come again, that we would be active and attentive to sharing your goodness, to displaying your goodness that we are open to you doing an incredible work in us and through us. But again, as we've read, Lord, these are the acts of you, our King, so that we can never boast about how good we are. 
So keep us humble. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would work in us, that you would renew us and empower us. That we would keep our eyes focused on you, our true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who 